Hello, I'm Maya Jaggi. It gives me great pleasure to share with you my long appreciation of the work of Mia Kotu, winner of the 2020 Jan Michalski Prize for his profound and luminous trilogy of novels, The Sands of the Emperor. It is said that we can die from loss of blood. It is the opposite. We die by drowning in it. So says Imani, the trilogy's young heroine in its open pages, as wars across South southeastern Africa in the late 19th century set the world ablaze. After each battle, villages are torched, children die from poisoned wells, monstrous armored vessels advance upriver from the Indian Ocean, and the argument between sword and spear is being settled with brutal finality by the mechanized slaughter of the machine gun. Mia Kotu's novels weave this history together with myth, real and invented characters, philosophy and orality, letters and proverbs, to question, as he told me, how official history is built from lies and how it pushes out other stories. One character, a Portuguese lieutenant, writes in a letter, I gradually came to realize how far we are from understanding that territory that we aspire to conquer. How do these people think of themselves? How do they describe themselves? This trilogy, with its polyphonic structure and shifting perspectives, its deep affinity with indigenous languages and African worldviews, digs beneath the official lies to offer a tentative, nuanced, and multiple answer. The historical setting is the scramble for Africa as Portugal asserts its military hold over Mozambique, a grip that was to persist until independence in 1975. Yet while the trilogy alludes to European rivalry for the spoils of a continent, it powerfully reimagines the dying days of an African empire that was itself founded on terror and slavery by those with less regard for a human being than for an ox. The sprawling state of Gaza in southern Mozambique, the second greatest African empire ruled by an African, was defeated in 1895 by Portuguese forces. The Emperor Ngugunyane was deported to the Atlantic colony of the Azores, where he died in 1906. His remains were supposedly repatriated to Mozambique almost 80 years later. Yet rumor has it that all that was retrieved were lumps of sand. I met Mia Kotu in the ghostly presence of some of his historical characters on a visit to the Mozambican capital, Maputo, where he lives. It was perhaps our fourth or fifth meeting. When I first interviewed him in London 30 years ago, his deb debut short stories, Voices Made Night, were creating his reputation as a magical realist, a label he rejects, since what he writes, he insists, is the real thing, not magic. More recently, we spoke in Rome for a Guardian profile. In Mozambique, he showed me the 19th century Portuguese fort on Maputo Bay, overlooked now by the city's high rises. The fort's rusty cannons, equestrian statues of Portuguese generals and bronze reliefs of Ungugunyane's capture attest to official history. Yet the emperor's empty tomb has fueled competing myths. There were two big official lies about the same man, Mia told me on the red battlements of this sandstone fort. Not only was the Portuguese claimants of this sandstone victory a fiction because Ngugunya was already dying, but when independent Mozambique was looking for heroes, they built a fiction erasing that he was a dictator and tyrant. The emperor, who is now hailed as a resistance hero, was a Zulu invader, whose brutality towards local people rivaled that of his Portuguese enemies. The persistent shadow cast by these constructed her histories troubles the author. As Imani intuits, the worst thing about the past is what is still to come. The trilogy's self-contained volumes, Woman of the Ashes, The Sword and the Spear, and The Drinker of Horizons, move across the Portuguese empire from Mozambique to Lisbon and the Azores, as Ngugunyane is captured and exiled. Yet rather than focusing on the bronze heroes of Maputo Fort, Mia turns his ear to the whispers and murmurs of those buried beneath official history. He nurtures these invented voices with scrupulous care, perspicacity, and the humility I witnessed, whether he was mentoring young writers at the F Fernando Latte 
Kotu Foundation, set up to honor his poet father, or conversing with fishmongers in the market. Much of the tri trilogy is told through the alternating perspectives of Imani, a 15-year-old girl educated by priests, and the Portuguese sergeant Hermano do Melo, for whom she is the translator. Imani's Vashopi people, caught between rival invader occupiers, face a terrible choice to ally with the Portuguese or with Ngugunyane's rival forces. Her family is torn apart as her brothers choose opposing sides. In the first two novels, her thoughts alternate with Hermano's letters to his commanders as he awaits reinforcements from Lisbon or Angola or nurses terribly injured hands. The ambiguous love that bonds these two protagonists owes something to the limitations of their power. Neither is free. The provincial Hermano is a Portuguese Republican deported to Mozambique for mutinying in Porto and uneasy about Portugal's colonizing role. Imani, doubly burdened by her tribe and her womanhood, faces a cruel choice between becoming a prostitute in the colonial capital, Lorenzo Marquez, or being married off as yet another of the emperor's wives in her father's plot for vengeance against Ngugunyane. Imani eventually accompanies the emperor to Lisbon as an interpreter, but he, the vanquished barbarian, is deported to the Azores and Imani returns the only survivor. She is a frontier soul whose colonial education puts her at odds with her people and herself. She yearns to be reborn into my language, my beliefs. Through Imani's perspective, the trilogy encompasses contrasting worlds while translating between them. For example, when she describes her circular concept of time. When the Italian woman Donna Bianca, she says, travels on a river, she sees time. In the swirl of the current, she contemplates that which never returns. But for us, time is a drop of water. It is born in the clouds, enters the rivers and the ocean, and falls again the next time it rains. A river's estuary is the sea's source. Mia, like Imani, is a poetic translator between worlds. He was born in Beira, Mozambique's second city in 1955, to Portuguese communist parents who were escaping the fascist dictator, Antony Salazar. Growing up in a colonial house in the modern mangroves, he was educated to fight for independence and be part of the new country. On the other side of the road was Africa, he told me. In daily life, there was a borderline, but we were encouraged on, in our house to cross it. I played with black kids, heard their stories and spoke their languages. I was lucky. He went to study medicine, but joined the Mozambique Liberation Front for Limo. Though he dreamed of being Che Guevara, he was sent to infiltrate a colonial newspaper. And after independence, he directed the new Mozambique Information Agency. A description in the trilogy of the birth of a newborn soul, or Moya, from the voices of those who have already died, calls to mind Mia's own origins as a writer. During the 15 year civil war that followed the liberation struggle, many of his journalist colleagues were terrorized and killed. He realized, he told me, I'm a survivor. I feel lucky and guilty, protected. It's as if they're telling you that you'll be the one to tell a story. Writing his first novel, Sleepwalking Land, about the trauma of the civil war, he was plagued by insomnia. Every night, those people's voices came into my mind like a nightmare. Sleepwalking Land is deemed by African critics to be one of the continent's top dozen books of the 20th century. Initially a poet, Mia sees himself as a poet writing prose. His own urgent need to introduce ruptures inside the Portuguese language led him to do for Mozambican fiction what South American novelists such as João Guimarães Rosa had done for Brazilian writing, to break and remake the colonial language as their own. As well as coining neologisms, Mia confessed that he makes up proverbs, playing with their solemn sense of destiny and absolute truth, and trusting in literature to undermine our system of certainties. As Vera Mikalski discerns, the natural world exerts a compelling power in his novels. Antils are guardians of the rains and keepers of eternity. The groaning boards of a dugout boat are the tree 
calling for its offspring. As a three-year-old boy, Antoni Emilio Latte Cotto renamed himself Mia or Miao because he slept and ate with the cats on his veranda. I didn't just like cats, he said. I thought I was a cat. Every child feels that that more open borderline be between themselves and other beings and creatures. He studied biology after the war and lobbies for conservation as an environmental biologist. Biology, he told me, is my way of praying, of feeling part of something bigger. It's a language to understand our intimate relationship with the others, plants and animals. It's important to regain that link between nature and humanity. The late Swedish writer Henning Mankell, who had a home in Maputo, once described Mia as a white man with an African soul. Mia's view is different. I'm a white guy and an African, the son of Europeans and Mozambican, a scientist living in a very religious world, a writer in an oral society. These, he told me, are apparently contradictory worlds that I like to unite because they're part of me. Constantly crossing frontiers, his fiction rejects notions of pure cultures or exclusive identities. Whether inside or outside the garrison, Sergeant Hermano writes, we Portuguese live surrounded by walls, afraid of everything that we are unable to recognize. Yet Hermano senses that a greater openness and intermingling may be more fruitful. He says, who knows if Portuguese may not if Portugal may not achieve more for itself in this interweaving of such different people than in these bloody wars. Mia's writing has garnered acclaim across the Lucifone world where he won the Camões Prize in 2013 and in the English speaking world through his longtime translator David Brookshaw with a Neustadt Prize of 2014. His books are translated into two dozen languages. The trilogy, originally published in Portuguese between 2015 and 2017, crowns his oeuvre. Elizabeth Monteiro Rodriguez, her French translation and its recognition by the Jan Mikulski Prize, do a great service in extending the global community of his readership. Books are never written in Mani lands. When we read them, we write them. Through Mia Kotu's open, poetically resonant fiction, we as readers reimagine the past from multiple perspectives, the better to re-envision re the future without the borders that stunt and dehumanize us.